I understand that people are afraid, but I know where the collective consciousness is going. And how, if we've been paying attention, the collective consciousness is maturing very, very quickly to understand that to tap into your spirituality, what is that to live your life in spirit and inspired to find the authentic you? What is authenticity? Authenticity is to never betray ourselves, to speak from truth, to speak from a place of power and people believe what you say. That's how you know you're speaking from your true authentic power. Pauline, welcome back to the Book Thinkers Life Changing Books podcast. We had the chance to interview you a couple of months ago, and now you're back for a second episode. And here's where I'd like to start. Everybody in the Book Thinkers audience knows that I am an aspiring keynote speaker. It's something that I'm focusing on throughout 2024. And whenever I have the chance to speak with somebody like you, I want to be a sponge. I want to learn. I want to ask good questions. So let's start there. <laughs> What did your journey of speaking look like? And give everybody some context as to what types of stages you're currently speaking on. Um, I'll tell you what kind of stages I'm currently speaking on, and then I will rewind to how we got here. Um, I'm speaking internationally um, in front of, you know, thousands of people. The largest audience is a little bit over 4,000 people. Um, I spend quite a bit of time in the US speaking to um, all sorts of audiences from uh, lawyers to accountants to event planners to uh, speaker bureaus to agencies. So that's why it as an um, um, international keynote speaker for so there's different, there's, let me just break this down. As a keynote speaker, we set the key tone for the event. That's what a keynote speaker does. And so the key tone for the event, you are either the first speaker for the event or the first speaker of the day or the last speaker of the day. So your job is to inspire and set the tone, the key tone of the event. And from that, Every word, well, if you want to be a master at it, anyone can speak, but can you communicate? Can you influence the room? And so it gets to the point where we become so masterful that no word is wasted. Every pause is deliberate. We speak to cadence. We speak to nonverbals on stage. There's a difference when you speak like this and then your voice changes when you lower your hands and you pause. And so everything is a, a masterpiece, should you wish, should you wish. And every block on stage activates a different thought or a different response from the audience. And so when you get deep into the mastery of it, we don't um, – do things such as contaminate spaces on the stage with um, different parts of the story. So it gets really deep, you know, and that's when you can uh, really notice who is a master on stage and, and who is not. So it does become an art. And then you have a facilitator, someone on stage who is teaching, you know, um, by PowerPoint or um, they're telling you something educational or you have an educator. And so as a professional speaker, we get booked and paid very well by private corporations or um, organizations. As a public speaker, your uh, presentation is open to the public and public speakers sell something at the end. Um, I, I'm not a public speaker. Uh, I'm a professional speaker, so I get booked by um, people in, in in private. So that's the big, that's a little bit of a distinction. Um, I've been doing it now for over 15 years. When I first started, I wanted to call myself the spiritual entrepreneur, and if you can imagine, 15 years ago, it's like, oh, don't don't call yourself that, Pauline. People are afraid of that word. And I said, I understand that people are afraid, but I know where the collective consciousness is going. And how, if we've been paying attention, the collective consciousness is maturing very, very quickly to understand that to tap into your spirituality, what is that? To live your life in spirit and inspired, to find the authentic you. What is authenticity? Authenticity is to never betray ourselves, to speak from truth, to speak from a place of power and people believe what you say. That's how you know you're speaking from your true authentic power. And so 
to be um, uh, coming from 15 years ago where the people who represented me at the time were saying, don't, don't do that. I said, it's a Trojan horse. Just get me on the stage and I'll rock it for you. And um, I, I became one of the uh, most booked female speakers in Australia. Why? Because people, they're, they're, they're not just... They're, well, they're not just hungry for it. It's innately part of our makeup. Um, it's our birthright to be able to ask these questions. It's and so I people were curious, and then uh, with the with the stage mastery, something happens when we really move someone or poke someone in that way. And then, of course, there's all the energetics that come to um, prepare before, during, and after the keynote. But um, at that time, no one was speaking about, you know, mindfulness or meditation. Don't do that. That's woo woo. And so really sitting down in one spot, finding place of rest and tranquility and tapping into your inner self and listening to yourself and listening to the messages. That's woo woo. <laughs> I think that's called being human if you ask me, you know. <laughs> and so we're so mind centric. We're so running around. And so what I discovered as I was speaking more and more and more about spirituality some 15 years ago, everyone was hungry for it. They're so hungry for for something. There must be something more in this life. There must be more. And so, um, you know, fast forward now, people are really starting to discover, hey, there, there, there is an answer to all these questions to why I feel so stuck, why I feel this void, why I'm so hungry, why I'm so um, empty sometimes, you know. But um, it all started when I released my first book called Secrets of the Red Lantern. Uh, that, I, I released that in 2007, 2007, um, 2007, 2008. And I wrote it purely as a, uh, to create an heirloom for my daughter. Uh, my daughter was two years old at the time. And um, this is what happens when you speak from the heart, when you're not afraid of what people are going to think. And so I won debut writer of the year for it. No one was more surprised than I was. It became an international bestseller um, in those years where, um, you know, legit bestseller was that you had to sell um, a, a minimum of 50,000 copies around the world. Not these days where if you get all your friends to buy a copy on Amazon for a dollar, then you become an Amazon bestseller, right? You know, that was in those days where it was very different. And um, it was uh, an heirloom that I had intended to write for my daughter, but then I got all these letters from people all around the world and it's a very dark and personal memoir really dark and personal memoir which I disguised as a cookbook so people would buy it and it was on the back of the success of our restaurant Red Lantern which is the most awarded Vietnamese restaurant in the world and we're still around 20 years 22 years in business now and so I wrote this book and started getting uh, letters from people all around the world. And I get so emotional when I think about this time. Um, letters from survivors of domestic abuse, um, letters from those who were experiencing displacement, um, from refugees from all around the world, uh, letters from uh, Vietnam vets and those who actually went to war. And the biggest surprise for me, the biggest surprise were how many letters I got from children of um, parents who were survivors of the Holocaust because it was the same story. It was just a different war. And so with that, I just started getting all this attention and um, uh, started winning awards and traveling to do all these uh, um, uh, writers' festivals. And I was forced to speak on stage. And I had so much trauma that I hadn't uh, healed. Um, from growing up in a very, very, very violent upbringing. And um, I, the, while the book was cathartic, while I wrote it in words, I hadn't addressed the trauma that was sitting in my body, the traumatic, the, the, um, all the pain that I had been storing in my organs. And, and so here I am getting pushed on stage by the publishers and I said to them, are you sure you're not going to give me any media training? Because isn't this what you do? It was like when I wrote the book, I said, are you going to edit the hell out of this so that I can sound more intelligent because I'm not a writer? And they said, no, Pauline, 
this we need your authentic voice and they were right um, it touched so many people from around the world and then when I got on stage at all these writers festivals I couldn't speak it, the trauma was locked in my throat my throat shut down because I'd buried it so deep and I hadn't dealt with it I couldn't I couldn't until I had to really face it. And so I'm on stage. I am crying. I am frozen. I can't even tell my story because my trauma is now saying it's time to release this Pauline. And so while I was embarrassed, um, I also thought you guys don't deserve to see this. Like the audience doesn't deserve to see this. And also you don't deserve to see this. So it was on, on, on a couple of parts. And that was when I made the decision, I have to master this because I realized how many people I was able to impact and touch with my first book. But I have the opportunity now to stand on stage in front of hundreds of thousands of people and I need to master this thing. If I'm, if I'm going to do my self service and service to everyone else. And that um, was when I started um, really becoming masterful at it. I wasn't just going to, um, you know, be a dabbler with it. That's where it all started. And fast forward, here we are. <laughs> Pauline, I have like so many questions like coursing through my head right now. And I'm like trying to figure out and pick the right one. But I'm just going to go with my gut and I'm going to ask. Did that answer your question, Nick? <laughs> I think it more than answered. It also answered our follow-up questions. <laughs> oh, it was such a beautiful, it's such a beautiful story. When you were up on stage and you said you were like having like this traumatic, like you couldn't get the words out. Did, were you able to eventually get something out that were you able to speak something? Yeah, that was also the first time that, oh, I realized how kind the audience is. Oh, yeah. I realized how kind they are. And, um, you know, I coach speakers now. And also, you know, in my second book, which um, The Way of the Spiritual Entrepreneur, the book that you guys know, um, I won um, Best Entrepreneurship and Small Business Book Award for that. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. And um, uh, with that second book, there was a little bit of fear for me because while I was told to not speak about that on stage 15 years ago and not call myself the spiritual entrepreneur, now I'm releasing a book called The, Sp the Way of the Spiritual Entrepreneur, The Seven Secrets to Becoming Fearless, Stress-Free and Unshakable in Business and in Life. And um, my um, publicist at the time, I said, um, you know, shall I prepare for getting attacked in interviews? Should I prepare for um, having you know, the, the cynics and the skeptics. Oh, I think skepticism is, is, is very natural. Cynicism is a defense mechanism, right? And so um, I said, should I prepare? And she reminded me, she said, you know, most people who want to interview you, most people, most people, not all, most people who want to speak to you, most people who invite you on stage, they're kind. And then I remembered all those years ago when I when I froze on stage, everyone was so kind. And I was speaking, um, I remember vividly a, a friend of mine, Sean, he came to support me because it was one of my first um, speaking gigs um, as part of Writers' Festivals. And I was speaking in front of, it would have been about 600 librarians from all across Australia wanting to share my story in, in their book that was, that is now um, – and FYI, I, I, I love it because I still get the invitation still from parts of that book being in um, high school curriculums and um, university papers uh, and um, as, as part of, you know, the education piece for a lot of uh, teenagers growing up. And at the time, um, everyone in the audience was so kind. I just saw kindness in their eyes and uh, they gave me the time to breathe through it. Uh, my friend Sean later told me that he wanted to come up and slap me, to slap me across the face to get me out of that state, right? <laughs> but it was so kind and I, and I breathed through it and I was able to deliver the rest of my, um, my keynote. And, you know, while you want to, you know, while my story does uh, evoke emotion and pull at the heartstrings, as as a master on stage, there's a fine line. There's a fine line, um, and you want to take people on that um, emotional journey, 
and then but you don't want to I, I see so many speakers just go too far the other way and that for me is abuse we we can't we can't inflict that on on the audience they they don't know the mastery behind it and so they keep their audience in pain for too long and not everyone has the capacity to come out of it again so it is a a, a very um um uh, fine skill set to be able to take them there but then lift them up again to deliver the real message uh, and not to leave them with this blanket of um of trauma you're obviously, you, like you said, you're a master. You've worked on this, and I and even I still do. I now, still do. It's beautiful. It's amazing. <laughs> when you speak the truth, you align with God. I like really believe that, and I think that the fact that you were able to first speak the truth through the Red Lantern book, and then through the other books, and then just be yourself, like it is so powerful. I'm curious, like, what's your advice for people that are dealing with trauma, past traumas? Like, what is the first steps they can take to? start to heal from past traumas? The first step is always the decision um, to decide, to decide that you don't want to be here anymore because a lot of people, um, and I'm speaking from direct experience, uh, I coach, I've coached many people over the years. Um, um, now my niche is uh, spiritual entrepreneurs, but so many people have their trauma define them it becomes their identity. And before anyone starts coaching with me, we I send them a questionnaire. I don't speak to them yet. I, I protect my energetic field. I do send them out a questionnaire and the questions are very, very um, uh, decisive and um, definitive. And so what am I hearing out for? I'm hearing out for uh, verbiage of victimhood. I'm hearing out for verbiage still of vengeance or anger. And, um, you know, most coaches will say, well, you should be able to coach everyone. And it's like, yeah, but what if I don't want to? What if I only want to coach the ones who are actually ready? And then we give um, both people, both people give one another permission. So the first is always the decision stage. Why? Because unbeknownst to a lot of people, they are a addicted to the emotions of the past. They are addicted to retelling the story over and over and over again. So the neuropeptides in their body start saying, oh yes, we're familiar with this story. We're going to give her this huge sense of certainty now. And so they have to come to a point where it says, I am done. I am done. I don't want to live like this anymore. So they have to decide, draw a line in the sand and say, I, from this point on, this is what it means to be resolute. You know, people have these New Year's resolutions. Come November, they still haven't resolved anything. So to be resolute is to say from this moment on, I'm done. That needs to be the decision. And so we never underestimate the power of a decision. And the second step is permission. Permission. You must give me permission. You must give yourself permission to come on this journey and to trust the process. But the process of this, um, you could call it a spiritual awakening, if you will. Um, I, I, I prefer to call it much much more realistic words. The process of spiritual awakening is not this love and light and peace and mung beans and everything is going to be amazing and fantastic. The spiritual journey is a very painful one. It's a journey of destruction. It's a journey of disruption to destroy everything that you thought you were, who you took yourself to be. And then once we go through that process of destruction, then we can go through the process of rebuilding. And so those are the first steps. The first step is to decide and then give the other person who is your guide, your teacher, your coach, your mentor, your new peer group, to give them permission and from there to give yourself permission to live a very, very different life. But understanding, understanding that it is not from a place of love, light, peace, love, mung beans. That is not what the spirituality that I teach is about.
I'm sitting here today with Ken Rusk, who has done hundreds of millions of dollars in business. He's also sold tens of thousands of books and changed countless lives. We're sitting here today because he is sponsoring today's episode. So Ken, tell everybody about your course. Well, thank you. I built a course called The Path to a Successful Life. It's designed around trying to get somebody unstuck. You know, sometimes you're feeling like you're kind of stuck in where you are and you're not really sure what you want your life to look like or how to go about getting it. Well, for the cost of about dinner and a movie and maybe the time you'd spend on a weekend, you can exactly what you want your future look like and how to go about getting it. You know the power of vision. That's why you watch podcasts like this. So click the link below, get signed up and let me know what your experience is like. Well, I think it's some, I think it's very important to decide to overcome trauma before you start speaking as well. So to kind of bring yeah. it back to the speaking world, what are two or three actionable steps that somebody in my shoes can take to master the art of speaking? Because I host a lot of podcasts. I create a lot of content on social media. I've taken a couple of classes, but I have a long way to go. And yeah. I'm just curious what your next steps would be if you were in my shoes. So, um, Nick, I would um, separate it first. So as a keynote speaker, it's a very different skill set to being a podcast presenter. That's a different skill set to being a facilitator teaching in front of the room. That's a different skill set again. And so if we were to speak to keynote speaking, as we started this podcast speaking about, the very, very first thing, and, and this is um, sometimes, I, you know, the, the speaking um, teachers uh, will hate me for this, to understand that it's not a, a seven-day course. I, I'm speaking to keynote speakership, Yes. I'm not speaking to any other kid. Why? Because you have to really craft your story. They're going, why, why should they listen to you? Why am I going to listen to you to inspire me? Why am I going to book you to set the key tone for this whole conference of hundreds or thousands of people? Why would I? And so you have to really give them or have to have a reason to speak for them. Do you have a story? Or if you don't think you have a story, can you get someone to help you dive deeper into your story? And then from there, the first part is to craft the story. And sometimes, so I, I had a, um, a client who, uh, this is, it would be for almost three years ago now, her, um, three years ago, and uh, her husband died of cancer. And three years ago, she was still in it. She was still in the grief stage. And by the way, grief is a wonderful doorway to transformation if, if you know how to um, um, work with grief. And I said, what do you want to speak about? And she goes, I want to speak about grief and death and dying. And I said, okay, so you want to be a keynote speaker. Tell me why a conference of say 4,000 people will want to, to listen to you set the key tone on the world stage and talk about grief and death and dying. If it is not a conference about grief and death and dying, why should people listen to you? And she took it really, really well, cause why? She decided that she wanted me to be her coach and two, she gave me permission. And I said to her, do you know that your husband dying of cancer is a so what story? It's so what? So what? And I said that, to, to land a particular point, right? I didn't say that to, I have no interest in upsetting people or, you know, insulting them for no reason. And I said, if you trust the journey of your own evolution and this journey that we're going to have together to coach you out of and help you coach yourself out of this grief period, your husband dying is going to be something that happened. Something, by the way, happened because what is on the other side and who you are going to become because of this, that's when people are going to say, that is why I'm going to listen to her. And so it's not going to be, it's going to be something else. We don't know yet because we haven't seen how you're going to evolve and how you're going to grow and what more layers you're going to have through this journey. But when I meet you on the other side, when we hold hands and dance together on the other side, your husband dying is going to be something that just happened that has 
been a part of your story that has made you who you are, that has given you um, credibility, so to speak, so that you can speak from this um, from from this position. But your job as a keynote speaker is to set the key tone with inspiration, with spirit. So let us make you as inspirational as possible, so that you can become a person on the keynote stage that people want to listen to. And so she's been with me now for you know almost four years and whatever has come about is so much more so much more rich and beautiful than someone on stage who's speaking about her husband dying of of cancer and so the beautiful part of it is her keynote changes and changes and changes all the time and so these things take time we have to get the content first before we get the wordsmithing we have to dive deep into the person so that they can believe you on stage Otherwise, you know, you can smell a phony a mile away, right? And then get that really uh, masterful first. And that comes well, well, well before the stagecraft. Sorry, and Nick. the stagecraft just... takes time too. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I keep uh, asking questions, Nick. Did you have anything that you wanted to follow up? Sorry. <laughs> oh, I, okay. I, lo I no, lost. No, no, no. All good. All, right. All good. All right. Yeah. Um, well, okay, so Luke, and if, if I can just um, answer one, one more question with Luke, a part, yeah. and, and the other part also is that um, for, for yourself, Luke, you have the authority. You yeah. are an author. You, 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 you have read a gazillion books. And so the journey also, why it takes a while is to build your authority, your credibility, whether it be birthing a new book, whether it be birthing a podcast, whether it be birthing a whole lot of blogs, you have to give, you have to have the library of authorship of authority. Otherwise, why on earth would people pay you all that money or spend all that time um, to listen to you? And that's that's the important part that takes time to build as well. Um, I was at a, um, a, a conference um, of a, a very well-known speaker um, and he was telling everyone that everyone has a book, everyone has a story and and go out and, and I just shook my head and, and I said, everyone does have a story, but is it a so what story? Is it a so what story, I man? Me too. And it's a so bit interesting. A pill to swallow, right? A bit of pill to swallow, yeah. but that's the reality. And how do you know if it's a if it's a so what story? Like people, that, people will tell you. Your, your, coach, your coach will tell you. <laughs> well, I just want to throw something out there. In that uh, we had we interviewed an author recently, Matt Higgins. Uh, he's guested on Shark Tank and wrote a, a best selling book, Burn the Boats, and he. One thing that he expressed was his discontent with how many authors tell us so what story, basically. Like, oh. <laughs> okay, you, you know, your parents passed away or, you know, you had a rough childhood and you grew up in the ghetto or, you know, you lost your best friend or your dad doesn't like you or whatever. It's like, so what? Yeah, yeah. I agree. So what? And uh, I think it's a really important point that you're making. If you want to write your story and tell your story, it has to be more than so what? Yeah. And, and that comes with a lot of ego strength. You have to have ego strength to be able to um, have that message land. Can you maybe unpack that a little bit? Like what is, what would you consider ego strength to let that land? So for example, my friend, if I said to, or my, my, my client who is now my very good friend, if I said to her, um, Yvette, this is your husband dying is a so what story? To have no ego strength would to be walk away and say, fuck you, Pauline, you've insulted me. What do you know? How dare you? You know, and, and I, as, as, a, as a coach, that's the, one of the first things I say, you have to have a lot of ego strength to work with me because I want to get you there fast. And in order to get you there fast, we have to walk down not one long haul of mirrors, numerous long hauls of mirrors. And that's the, that's the, what, 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 People, someone asked me the other, the other day, what do, you, what do you do, Pauline? And I said, I am a freedom fighter. I'm a freedom fighter. I help people and myself fight against the, um, you know, society's, this, this conforming, society, what society expects of me. I love doing what people don't expect of me. You know, fighting against uh, these confines, the, the boxing me in, you know, labeling me. But most of all, I'm a freedom fighter, a, a freedom from myself. 
freedom from my self-imposed limitations, freedom from all the stories I've been telling myself about myself and believe, freedom from the propaganda of my distortions. So I'm a freedom fighter. That's what I do. And so for someone to have ego strength is to say, I've decided I don't want to live like this anymore. I've given Pauline permission. I also now give myself permission to release everything and to start anew. Um, so ego strength. And I, I get a, a lot of requests also for from parents who want me to um, coach their teenage children because they've had so much um, uh, life changes themselves. And I, I won't to coach their teenage children. They are not for me because most teenagers I know, they don't have the ego strength to work with me. Yeah, I mean, that makes perfect sense. And it can be so hard for somebody who, you know, a teenager or somebody who's lower in this this level. Um, no, to, no, no, if, if I, could, I never, yes, I never yes. use the word lower, Luke. Lower. There's no lower or higher. It's simply an mm. earlier stage. Earlier stage, <laughs> an earlier, earlier stage. They haven't lived the life yeah. yet. They haven't had the experience yet. And so if we as you use earlier and later, my niche, I prefer to work with people who are at a later stage of development. So we're mm -hmm. never higher or lower because you were there once too, right? <laughs> yes. Yes. Not long ago, I was there. <laughs> it's, it's a beautiful thing. Like you're talking about, um, it's like depression. You know, we talked to you talk a little bit about the addiction to the emotion. For so long, I was addicted to this feeling of depression. It was comfortable for me. And it was like, just me seeing that and admitting that to myself, it was like such an eye opening moment to me. I was like, holy smokes, I literally enjoy this. Like I get up in the morning and I want to be depressed. Because yeah, because I'm it gives you certainty. It. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's 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 the same certainty as why one would you know um ha smoke and you know when when we smoke it it's not that oh it's not only that if i take this inhalation i i was a smoker in my young teenage party girl years you know and it's not that so much as if i inhale my body will feel better sure but it's also the the knowing that if i inhale i will definitely feel this <laughs> it's that it's that you know and and so um you wake up because it's familiar yeah, and a quick Google search says that you know it. roughly 280 million people suffer from depression. So it's like, so what? Like, good yeah. for you and everybody else, you know? It's a stage and you have to move past it. I love that perspective. Through choice, if you want, if you want, right? Because not everyone wants to heal. Um, yeah, I want to bring the ones I love along with me. And I've realized as I've, as I've gotten to the next stage in my development that they're not on the same path. And it's really, really difficult for me to not like, want to just like, I don't know, shake them and be like, wake up, let's get to the next stage, get over the depression. So what, and all this, and they're not there yet. So what's your advice to somebody like me who feels like I am getting through to these next stages, but the people I love and care about are still in their earlier stages? Yes. And, and so Luke, um, I speak a lot to um, responsibility if we break up the word is to be response able, to be response able. And so, um, and this may be, uh, 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 the more perspectives we can hold, the more free we will become, right? And so uh, I'll, I'm going to frame it this way. Who the hell are you to fix them? <laughs> what right do you have? This, and, and, I, and I say that to um, trigger you a little bit, right? Because what you're, offering there is over responsibility. How do you know what they're going through is not meant to be their path? That's like saying to my um, uh, 18 year old daughter, come on, be 25 year old already. Come on. She has to go through the stages. They have to go through the stages. And so the, the journey of healing is revealing. And in order to reveal that you have to feel it. In order to heal it, you have to feel it. And so to understand that they're not ready for it to be seen. They're not ready for it to be revealed to them. It was revealed to you and you were ready to see it. 
not everyone is ready to see it. And so until they're ready, you can push them and go, hurry up, grow up already, grow up already. But who are you to, to, to um, make them go faster on their life journey? But the best thing, the biggest advice that I could give you, Luke, you go on your trajectory. You grow as much as your heart's desire. You now follow your path. And then one day, one day they're going to say, hey, babe, can I have some of that, please? Can I have some of that, please? Because they're going to watch you and they're going to, they're, everyone's always watching. People are always watching. And so um, the best advice is to love them, to hold them in that, to hold space for them, to answer any questions they have. But it's a, um, it, it's, it, a, a, ego is involved a little bit as well. So it's a case of your journey is your journey. I love you. I will always be here for you, but I can't make you go any faster than you wish to. But then one day, I promise you, if you keep on your journey and those that really love you, they're going to say, can I have some of that, please? And so the, 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 the purpose of ego is this sense of security, right? And so for those who are in the earlier stages, the purpose of ego is security, the nature of ego is insecurity. The destiny of ego is surrender. What does that mean? It means the purpose of ego. No, no, I got to put on this mask. I got to put on this armor. I got to speak this way. Ego is trying to protect me. But isn't that in and of itself insecurity? To always want security is in and of itself insecurity. And so the purpose Fact. of ego is security. And the nature of, of ego is insecurity. But the destiny of ego, the destiny of ego is ultimately surrender. To surrender what? To surrender wanting to fix people. To surrender to going on your life journey, surrendering to, and you mentioned earlier on this connection with God. God for me is the grand organized design, the universe, the absolute surrender to the basic trust that this universal intelligence is far, far, far more intelligent than this human brain could ever be. And when we live that life, things change like a gazillion fold. We, live, we start living life very, very differently when we understand that. You're just speaking so much truth. And it's really wild because you, you said the the stages like you can't fix them. And I was just thinking back to my my life. And I'm like, yeah, how many times did I receive a message or receive something and didn't wasn't able to take it because I wasn't ready for it yet? Because it wasn't my path. And, um, and that's just okay. thank you so much for that. Yeah, and that's okay. But we, we can't. Why, why can't we? Because they are in an earlier stage of development. And we can't will ourselves to go through it faster by ourselves. Otherwise, it wouldn't be development, would it? <laughs> we have to give ourselves time to develop just as we need to give them time to develop. But if we get the right teachers, the right coaches, the right peer group, um, uh, we read the right books, we learn the lessons and we integrate, we integrate. And they're going to watch you and say one day, please, Luke, can I have some of that? Well, Pauline, as Bookfinkers continues to grow and as we host in-person events, we'll definitely have you come and kick things off. Uh, <laughs> It'll be keynote. my joy. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. For somebody in the audience that's like, hey, I'd like Pauline to speak at my next event or conference or know somebody that might want to interview you for a spot, uh, what's the best place to go? How do people get in touch? Oh, thank you. That'll be amazing. Look, I'm on um, uh, Instagram, I'm on LinkedIn, but the best way to, um, I represent myself, um, to connect with me on my website and look up um, speakership, keynote speakership, keynotes on my website, pauline-nguyen.com. Amazing. We will definitely get all of that in the show notes. And Luke, any final questions before we let Pauline go? I just want to just express my gratitude for you. Thank you for your time and uh, the space and talking. Your story is incredible. I literally, like, I was so excited to talk to you today. So, and you just completely over-delivered on expectations and everything else. So thank you so much. This has been such a blessing of a time. And I can't wait until the next time we get to get to talk to you. Amazing. It was my joy. And thank you so much, Nick and Luke. And, um, you know, lots and lots of love to you guys and to your audience.